Hello YouTube, in this video we're going to be discussing the basics of grouped frequency distributions, okay? Uh, in previous video we discussed the categorical frequency distribution that dealt with qualitative data, that is non-numerical data. In this uh, particular video when we talk about grouped frequency distributions, the first and most important thing to notice here is we say grouped uh, basically implies that we're dealing with quantitative data. So quantitative, which means we can count it. And so uh, this, this term grouped comes from the basic fact that You'll notice that our classes over here, of which we have one, two, three, four, five, six classes, uh, we've grouped a bunch of values together. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and point a few things out about group frequency distribution. Starting with this, uh, we still tally up, uh, and, and this is arbitrary data; it doesn't go with any particular data set. But we still tally up the number of data values that fall within these particular class limits, what we call class limits. Okay, uh, and so you can see the tally marks here. Actually, really convenient when trying to describe a data set in terms of uh, looking at it. It's a lot better than looking at raw data because we can see obviously that that uh, you know there was more of a prevalence of data values in this little this little area of values or range of values over here. Uh, we also have frequency, and then cumulative frequency is going to be a new concept we discuss in this video. But um, class limits. Let's go back over to class limits now. Uh, what I want you to notice is that there are six classes, and these class limits. Uh, first of all. Um, there are six of them. I think I just mentioned this, uh, but we can determine class width, class width, which is something that we're interested in doing quite a lot of the time. But we say class, class width. So this would be one thing we want to define in this video. We say the class width is essentially the the amount of data or number of data values that fall within each particular class. So you'll notice this first class goes from 24 to 30. Now one thing I want to point out is this: the class width here. We would say this would apply to all values 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. And if we were to count these up, we'd say, okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 values. The interesting thing here is if I were to ask how wide is this class, 30 to 24, I always get a lot of students that say, well, 30 minus 24 is 6. And so there are six values there. But to do so actually subtracts the, the actual 24, which which you'll notice here we are including in that class. So we have to count that. So the rule of thumb is this. Essentially, the class width can be determined by taking the class limits of a particular class, like 24 and 30, subtracting them, and then adding one onto this. If we were to add one onto our six, we'd get the class width. Um, but in terms of calculating class width, we're going to say the rule of thumb is basically this. We could take the lower class limit of one class and subtract it from the lower class limit of the next particular class. If we were to take 31 minus 24, we would get 7. Or if we were to take, for example, 52 minus 45, we would get 7. Okay. And this also works for our upper class limits. That is, 58 minus 51, we get 7. Or, for example, 37 minus 30, we get 7. But in this case, our class width is 7. So we say, okay, so to determine the class width, our rule of thumb would just be this. Subtract the lower class limits. We'll just go with the lower uh, class limits of two consecutive classes. Okay, And by two consecutive classes, I just mean one right after another. Uh, but we always wanted to determine this class width. Um, also this. You'll notice that uh, a group frequency distribution also has class boundaries, okay? And a lot of students tend to struggle with these boundaries, but we also say, you know, like looking at the first class here, we have 23 and a half. We're not going to call this our lower class limit. We'll call it a lower class boundary, okay? Lower class boundary and our upper class boundary. And the way I got these for my limits is simply this. I said, let's take our lower class limit, which was 24, and, uh, well, you, well, you'll notice that the original class limits over here, they go out to a whole number. Okay, they've been rounded off to the nearest whole number. Um, so the class boundaries, the rules done on the class boundaries is this. They always go one more place value out uh, than your original data did. Okay, so since our original data and our class limits went out to the nearest whole, our class boundaries will go out to the next place value, which is the tenths. You'll notice also that all the class boundaries end in five. But basically, to get my class boundaries here, 23 and a half, I just took a half off of my original lower class limit of 24. And to get my 30 and a half, I just added a half onto uh, my upper class limit of 30. And this is consistent throughout all the classes. If you just take the lower class limit of the class and subtract off that half, 
then you'd get the lower class boundary. So for example, 38 minus a half is 37 and a half in our, 30, our third class. And if we take the upper class limit there of 44 and a half, we get 44 and a half as our upper class boundary. The particular difference between class limits and class boundaries simply is this. Um, you know, what if you had a data value that, uh, for example, was like 23.7, where 23.5 or something, you know, maybe we'll go with this, 30.5. So 30.5, if you look at your class limits, you know, it goes from 24 to 30 and then 31 to 37. 30.5 is somewhere between 30 and 31. So the, the purpose that class boundaries serve is to basically make our classes uh, all continuous but not overlapping. So if we were to just use limits, we say 30 is the upper class limit of our first class, 31 is the lower class limit of our second class, then there's a gap there. Where, as you'll notice the class boundaries, we read these as this. So for example, the first class we would read as all values 23 and a half up to but not including 30 and a half. And then our second class picks up where the first one left off. We say including 30 and a half up to but not including 37 and a half. So basically, our class boundaries do a very, very good job of, of being very continuous, okay, all brushing up against one another, but also not overlapping. Okay. So um, we commented on finding class width. Class width, we can just subtract two lower class limits of, of two consecutive classes. Uh, and then also how to get your boundaries from your limits. And um, so now I'd just like to comment on a few general things about, um, about uh, group frequency distributions. Starting with these, we say, uh, we say tips. I guess we could call this tips. So our first tip is this. Uh, when you construct a group frequency distribution, I often get this question. I say, well, how many classes should you have? And I want you to imagine this data set here obviously had a minimum of 24. So we say this is our min, min of 24. Now I can't necessarily say that our maximum was 65. I don't have the raw data. But 65 obviously goes either to the same as the maximum or past it a little bit um, at least. We say, you know, if we had all this data 24 to 65, it wouldn't make much sense to make a class that included only 24, and a class that included only 25, and a class that included only 26, uh, because you'd have so many classes, and it would be, if you look at the tally over here, you know, of number of data values that fall within each particular class, it'd be very, very kind of um, spread, too, too far spread apart. So in terms of number of classes, we'd say essentially this, should be between... 5 to 20 classes. 5 to 20 classes is typically, there's no hard and set rule, you know, uh, but, but this is a good kind of rule to follow. So we want to always have 5 to 20 classes in our distribution. Um, the next thing is this, we say we want class width to be odd. Now, I do want to take a, a moment to pause and talk about this one a little bit. And I want to say, class width, why would I want my class width to be odd? Um, and this is like a desirable thing, okay? It's not a necessity. However, what I will tell you is this. Uh, what this causes to happen is then, then, then our class midpoint will be a whole number. So we're going to talk about our class midpoint, which, by the way, is written x with this little m here, x subscript m, or x sub m. But let's talk about uh, class midpoint. We need to know how to calculate this. So we say the class midpoint, of course, as I've just mentioned, you know, if you're ever taking notes on this stuff, you want to write, is written x sub m. Uh, but it's basically this. It is the average of the limits of the class. So, for example, the class midpoint of our first class up here, say class midpoint of our first class, would be the average of the two values there. So we say 24 plus 30, which were our limits, divided by 2. Now this is 54 divided by 2. This is 27. So our class midpoint of the first class is 27. If I put this up here next to our first class, you'll notice that uh, 27 is the number that is, of course, perfectly between 24 and 30. Uh, you know, for example, the last class here, we could say the class midpoint of the last class, and then we'll generalize this. We say 59 plus the upper class limit is 65 all over 2. So 50 plus 60 is 110. 9 plus 5 is 14. So we got 124 halves 
124 halves and half of 124 seems to me to be 62, 62. And 62, of course, is perfectly between 59 and 65. Now, uh, this was when we had a class width of 7, which is, of course, an odd number. And you'll notice that both times we calculated class width, uh, well, both times we calculated class midpoint, we got a whole number. Okay. What if we had had an even class width? That is, what if our classes, for example, were something like 20, 20 to 23? And then 24 to 27, and, and, and so on and so forth, 28 up to, uh, what we got here, uh, 31. Uh, this has a class width, and we can calculate this. If we subtract 24 minus 20, we get 4. 28 minus 24, we get 4. Um, if we were to find the class midpoint now, say of the first class, we say, okay, so 20 plus, plus 23 all over 2. It's our class midpoint of our first class here, um, then we would get 43 over 2, 43 halves, half of 43 would be, oops, half of 43 uh, looks like 21.5, okay, and 21.5 is indeed, is indeed the midpoint of 20 and 23, it's just that it's a decimal, and it goes back to this idea that, look, class width should be odd, we want it to be odd. <clears throat> Because if it's even, it's undesirable is basically the case. Nobody said you can't make an even class width, it's just we don't want it. Okay, so in general, class midpoint, here's what, here's what you would want to write down, say in like your notes or something like that. We say lower, lower class limit plus upper class limit all over 2. And if you wanted to make yourself another note, basically this is just the average of the two values in the class. Okay. So, moving right along, number three. What do we want to know about number three in terms of suggestion? We say classes are mutually exclusive. Are mutually exclusive. Now, this is a fancy term for they do not overlap. Okay. They don't include, you know, um, values that they share. So for example, uh, a poorly constructed distribution would be something where we had uh, class limits, class limits uh, that look like this. We say 10 to 20, and then 20 to 30, and 30 to 40, and so on and so forth. This would be bad because if I said, well, what if I had a datum of 20? Would you put it in the first class or the second class? And so we do not want to make classes that overlap, so we want to make them mutually exclusive or exclude values between each other. Okay, my fourth suggestion is this: classes are continuous. Classes are continuous. You know what we mean here by this is, uh, let's say, let's say going back to this really poorly constructed one that we just made right here, and and I know that it's poorly constructed, but let's say we had like a tally running here. But we got done with this, even though this is, the limits are messed up. Uh, we say, well, you know, there were five data in the first class and two data in the second class and no data in the third class, and we had one datum in the last class. Uh, just because there are no tally marks, nothing here, nothing. Poorly looking nothing there. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can exclude this. So you could never have a distribution that said something like, you know, 10 to 20, Let's go proper this time, 21 to 31, and we say next one will be, you know, 40, 32 to 42, and then uh, 43 to 53. Like, you couldn't do this. You, you can't leave out a class in between the distribution, okay? So everything has to be continuous. All right, the next suggestion is simply this. They have to be exhaustive. So classes are exhaustive. exhaustive. So basically there has to be enough classes to to cover all the data. Uh, you know, uh, it, it'd be like saying, you know, I'm trying to find a spot to squeeze this in here. Uh, if we had, if we had, you know, our data set, our min was equal to 20 and our max was equal to 50, and then, you know, so we had our classes go from, from 20 up to 29 and, 
The next one goes 30, 